How about you talk a little bit about like why? Because I think that could be an interesting question. Like why, when you measure position, you just have no idea about momentum. I mean, intuitively, there is a picture I can paint, but mathematically, you just have to do the math. But yeah, mathematically can, is a little different. But I yeah. think like you can still explain like you know the whole no, yeah. the wave. You know what I mean, right? Yeah, like, I mean, uh, we, we have explained this before, but I can also give you like an intuitive picture as to why we can't measure the position and the momentum at the same time. And that all comes down to the fact that when you zoom into matter a lot, things like the very act, and it, I remember being so confused about this. Like, why, why is the fact that I observe something changing the properties of the thing itself? And here's why, because when you zoom in so far, the size of photons, well, I'm not going to talk about the size of photons, but you know, like a photon itself and a, uh, a particle like interact on the same like energy type mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's like, if I, if I send a photon at an electron, that electron can absorb the energy from the photon and, you know, become more excited or it can emit Somehow a photon happened. and became and become less excited if it's in a bound state of an atom, you know whatever whatever um the thing is that you know we've observed this uh through like the compton effect for example and the compton effect is that if you bounce a photon off of a particle or i think it's an electron or something if you bounce a photon off of an electron um, based on the angle of deflection it will tell you um, how much momentum has been transferred. And so you can actually see that you send in a photon that has some wavelength and then you bounce it off of something. Then you measure the wavelength again of that photon and you see that the wavelength has elongated. Mm. Why? Because uh, longer wavelengths of light have less energy, which means that it transferred energy to the thing that it bounced off of. Mm -hmm. Boom. Now, now here's where it gets interesting. What if I say I want to measure the position of a particle? What does that really mean? That means that, well, I need some like visual representation or some like numerical representation of that position in some coordinate system. How do you measure the position? Well, you need some sort of thing to go out, see where it is, and then come back into your detector and be like, oh yeah, that's where it is, right? Mm -hmm. That's the only way you can really make a measurement. Like you can't send out uh, information and then it never come back to you because then you'll just mm. you, you'll have no way of recording something. So you want you want a signal to go out and to come back and then to confirm. Yes, that's where it is. And so in this case, when you look at something, that's because photons are bouncing off of that thing and going into your eyes. But when I look at Rayhan right now, photons are coming off of his face into my eyes and I can see where he is because of that. But He's so big that the energy that a photon transfers to his face as it bounces off is so, so negligible that, you know what, even though a photon has bounced off of Rayhan, he's still here. He hasn't gone out because mm -hmm. of the sheer force of the photon. But remember how I said that when you zoom in very, very far. So my individual electrons probably. <clears throat> exactly. You know, some electrons probably went haywire. Exactly. What happens is that when you send photons at electrons, they literally bounce off of the electrons and the electrons go somewhere, right? Now, if I go to measure the position of a, a very small particle, I am bouncing photons off of that particle and those photons are coming back into my detector and saying, yes, this particle is in fact here. But from the time that the photons bounced off of the particle to the time that they were detected and I can say, ah, oh, yes, here is the particle. Remember, those photons transferred momentum to the particle. And that particle bounced off of the photons at some angle. And by the time that I can confirm the position, I have no idea where that particle is because it just bounced and it's somewhere else now. And so that's kind of an intuitive idea as to why if I measure the position, I don't know the momentum. And if I go mm -hmm. to measure the momentum, I have no idea about the position because mm -hmm. that's just... That's just how it works when you zoom in really far. And an interesting thing that comes out of that is, I love talking about this, the observer effect. I don't know. I don't think we spoke about it on the podcast before. Okay. I don't know. Um, anyways, the observer effect is like this common, very, very, very common. Okay, I think I'm getting deja vu right now. I might have mentioned this before. But anyways, we're talking about quantum mechanics and you were talking about observations. So I just feel like it's a cool thing to mention. 
the observer effect is like a very common misconception in quantum mechanics. And we were talking about this the other day, I remember. And it's basically exactly what you said. When you're measuring something, you're usually altering the state of said something. So what happens in the state after you've measured it will change after your measurement. And in quantum mechanics, like a common thing is people don't really realize, well, when is the measurement done and how does it affect the state? Common, simple example, the double slit experiment. You know, when everyone says, oh, you look at it and it breaks. Like, that's not really why, though. Like, the, the reason it, it's breaking is because when you look at it, as you very well rightfully just said, what's happening is a photon is bouncing off of the electron and coming into our eyes. Or, or what, I guess we're not doing it with electrons, but whatever particle we end up doing it with, whatever we're observing, we're going to be changing its state. So what that's basically doing is that's pinpointing the electron. Oh, it's right there. Right. Let's say let's say we have an electron and let's say we're observing it. Let's just say with our eyes, obviously, very, very simple analogy here. What's happening is the photon is bouncing off the electron coming into our eyes and everyone's like, oh, yeah, this just broke quantum mechanics. Right. Like there was a big thing and big misunderstanding of, oh, if you observe something that breaks quantum mechanics. But no, no, that doesn't break anything that actually follows the laws. It's just about what's happening when you say you're breaking quantum mechanics. And this is the observer effect that when you observe something, you basically change its state. Mm. And therefore, any measurement made with said state after observation is completely futile. Mm -hmm. right? Super powerful. I wanted to talk about the Schrodinger equation. Oh, that's a crazy one. Because the Schrodinger equation is very, very cool. <laughs> so what is the Schrodinger equation really saying? It, it has, it's essentially an eigenvalue equation, which just means that if you have some state if you measure the kinetic energy of it plus the potential energy involved, you will get the total energy. And so that's all the Schrodinger equation is saying. It's saying that you have um, the first term is minus h bar squared over 2m times the second, or I guess the, the Laplacian of the thing. The Laplacian is just, you know, you take two spatial derivatives in each direction and it turns out that you know i'm not going to explain why but it turns out that the second derivative let's just talk about one dimensional wave functions here the second derivative of the wave function is related to the kinetic energy then uh, for the potential energy you just multiply the potential times the actual function and this equal to I think it's like uh, I h bar times the time derivative of the thing. Now, what does all this really mean? On the left side, you have something called the Hamiltonian. And what the Hamiltonian does is it just measures the total energy involved. And on the right side, you have just the energy of the thing times the thing itself. So it's, it's, if you break it down, it's really simple. But, you know, it's still hard to use if you're taking quantum mechanics right now. It's still kind of, they pose you a problem and you just have to play around with the mathematics and solve it. And I want to talk about one of the problems I did this year, but it might go on for too long. So I'm just going to get to the point of what I'm trying to say. Um, yeah, so far we're I wanna, just talking about quantum mechanics. Yeah, <laughs> I, wanted, I, I wanted to talk about the mathematical description of a plane wave and why it is how it is. And it's, this is very interesting. So a free particle, you can imagine a free particle as just a ball rolling on a floor that is just perfectly level. And this analogy is, um, is used because there is no like gravitational potential change in this case. If you were to roll the ball up a ramp, then the kinetic energy would give way to the potential energy as it goes up the ramp and then the ball would be able to stop and then roll back down. But if there's no ramp, the floor is just, we're assuming no friction, the floor is just flat and you send a ball at a specific momentum, it will have that momentum forever. And so one of the defining qualities of this ball, and now think of the ball as a particle. So one of the defining qualities of this particle is that we know it's kinetic energy because we say, or I guess we, we can observe the momentum to have one single value. 
And if we measure it now, it'll have the same value later because there's nothing that can change that value. There's no sort of potential uh, that'll be able to take away from that. And so um, why is it that we have no idea about the position? Here's why. So if you uh, use the Schrodinger equation, you look at the right side of the equation where there's a time derivative. The energy, the energy term in here is just the kinetic energy. And so when you take a time derivative of this state, what you're going to get, or, you know, you multiply it by IH bar, whatever. Essentially, when you take the time derivative, you should have the energy times the function itself. Mm. Now, the only, you don't have to understand, if you're listening to this right now, you don't have to understand like half of the things I'm saying. <laughs> Just understand, understand the key points. And here's a key point. The key point is that when, when solving the Schrodinger equation, half the time you're guessing because that's what we had to do in the beginning, right? Now we know, you know, a, a very good way to describe a free particle. And it, it uses um, like e exponentials and like imaginary exponentials, meaning that it's like E to the I, in this case, I P X. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, not I P X. Um, I'm not even going to bother saying the yeah, math. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't have to talk any about the math. Just like talk about the <clears throat> concepts. Yeah. So when you when you take the time derivative of one of these exponentials, um, you will have the energy term come down from the exponential because that's how you take derivatives, um, and you know chain rule, and it comes down and you have this this um, this momentum value, and because that's the only thing contributing to the energy and we know the energy of the particle because we gave it a momentum um you can you can guess this exponential as a solution and as long as it works right as long as it works in the schrodinger equation then it is a valid explain a valid um way to write down the state mm -hmm.